Turn in your Bibles. Know what it says on the cover. It says Ephesians 1.10. But just go ahead and let's be daring and turn your Bibles and go to Ephesians 1.9. Um, does anybody miss college football as much as I do? Okay, I have been in like deep... I don't know what you, it's almost like addiction recovery, like the opposite of addiction recovery. Um, and I've been going crazy for it. But it's going to be satisfied, I think, on September 2nd. If not, I think the opener is a Thursday before that, but that'll be fine. Okay, now, I'm not going to say the name of the team that Auburn was playing on this day. I don't want to offend you. Uh, it was around Thanksgiving of 2013. And Auburn was not supposed to win because, you know, we are the incarnation of average in the eyes of many. And uh, but we had pulled off an interesting, miraculous victory the week before, and hopes were high. The, hang on. <laughs> and the, we were not winning when the bedtime of the girls came up. So the girls went to bed. We were probably going to lose. And we were just, you know, me and Becca were sitting in the living room watching the TV. And then someone decides to not run the clock out. And with one second to go, this excessively paid but highly intelligent and very classy and kind football coach decides to attempt a field goal. And he misses. Well, the coach doesn't do it. The kicker misses. It was, it was, it was an extremely unrealistic field goal to begin with. Some of you may know the story. And I'm living in the past. I know, I know. But this is the point. The point is coming. You know what happens after that. Now, what I want to talk about, though, is mine and Becca's reaction to this. We were more excited about what happened in that one second than the birth of our children. <laughs> So, the, the, you know, Becca I wouldn't was just, go that far. <laughs> now, I confess that I, I don't know why I thought this. I did not know some of the final rules of um, American college football. And I thought that returning an attempted field goal would give you a safety. And I was jumping up and down. He's going to get a safety. He's going to get a safety. We're going to win by one point. We're going to win. I didn't even know what that was. Man, I didn't know we could get a touchdown off that thing. But anyway, we got a touchdown. The reaction that we had was as if this thing was somehow important in the grand scheme. Thing. You're like, yes, it was important. It was so important. You know it was important. In the grand scheme of things, it was one football game. How many years ago? Too many. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't in the grand scheme of things important. What if we could talk about something that was truly life-changing and truly important? People still talk about that game. People still say when it's brought up, you're living in the past, you're living in the past. <laughs> but what if it was actually important. How much would we really talk about that? The Trinity, my friends, the doctrine of the Trinity is infinitely more important than some football game. Is it true? Yes. The Bible and the early church all testify to the Lord being three in one and one in three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Is it believable that God is three in one, one in three, and all that jazz? Yeah, sure. I mean, if Light can exist as two things at the same time, particle and wave, why not? If an electron can exist in multiple places at the same time, it's called superposition, I think, then why not? Why can't God be something like that? Three persons in one. How is the Trinity relevant to our lives? Because it teaches us to invest in relationships. At the heart of the universe is not some singular one-dimensional God, it is a relationship called the Trinity. Love existed before creation, folks. If there was one singular simple God, like the followers of Islam claim, for example, then at the heart of the universe is an individual. 
But the doctrine of the Trinity does not teach that. The doctrine of the Trinity teaches that at the heart of the universe, there is love. One God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who values love and relationship above all things. So is the doctrine of the Trinity important? Short answer, yes. Next question, why? First thing is it builds community. Now, I don't, let's look at, let's look at, back up, let's look at Ephesians 1.9. I'm about to launch into the sermon without reading the scripture, and there's some professor at Emory that would just throttle me for that. Scripture, Ephesians 1.9 and following. And he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect in the times that have reached their fulfillment bring all things in heaven and earth together under one head, even Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God, and all God's people said. Amen. Look at Ephesians 1.10. It says this, bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. The idea there is, well, look, the idea that one that is very attractive if you have one single simple God. It's easier to understand because one is a very simple moment. Pure monotheism, like the Muslims believe, um, always has a problem though. When you have one single simple God, there is no variety. Everything is about conformity. Everything that is different from that single, simple God is at best imperfect and at worst evil. Absolute monotheistic faiths tend towards sameness. Everything has to fit in the box. It is no accident that to study the Quran you have to learn Arabic because that one simple, one-dimensional God can only be expressed even through one book and one language. There are translations in bookstores of the Quran. I happen to have two on my shelf up in my office. But they are not, strictly speaking, the Quran because they're not written in Arabic. The Bible is absolutely different. When we read the Bible in English, we don't say that's just a translation. You have to learn the Greek and the Hebrew to really understand it. You can, you can get a little more insight by studying the Greek and the Hebrew. But for centuries, Christians have been falling all over themselves to translate the Bible into the native language of the people that they're trying to witness to. As many as possible. There are people who devote decades of their life and they live with isolated tribes, learning the native language, parsing out translations, all so that they can present the gospel and the word of God to those good folks in their native language. Now that's monotheism. That's absolute strict monotheism. On the other hand, if monotheism tends towards sameness, then polytheism tends towards chaos. If at the heart of the universe there's just a bunch of different gods with many different opinions and perspectives and moral relativism, then you have a vision of reality where the heart of everything is conflict and chaos. And the doctrine of the Trinity teaches something very, very different. The doctrine of the Trinity says that the heart of the universe is harmony and unity. A lot of us, well, not a lot of us, all of us, I think all of us, long at some level for harmony and unity, don't we? You turn on the news, maybe you're having an argument with your spouse, maybe you're having an argument with your kid, and we long for harmony and unity. Where do you think that longing comes from? I mean, have you ever really experienced real, solid, hardcore harmony and unity? I don't think so. I've had many moments of perfection. But we still all long for it. Where do you think that comes from? Somewhere in our DNA, spiritual DNA, there must be some source for that longing. If we don't long for it, that's another point. Only God can sing in true harmony and unity. There is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A harmony and a unity of love and purpose. And the doctrine of the Trinity gives us a teaching where we can embrace different parts and yet all sing together 
in unity and purpose and belief. I can't really sing. It is a tragedy for you to have to stand next to me while we sing. I don't understand how musical people like Sandy can hear this cacophony of whatever this is and, and still find the source, which I guess is the piano. Is that right? You listen to the piano when we sing? Okay, good. Are you looking at the music? Okay. See, I don't know. There's technical stuff here, but I don't know. But anyway, um, we sing different parts. What I mean by this is this. Christians in Africa or India or Mongolia are going to look different. They're going to sing different songs in different languages. But we are united. We are united within the Holy God, within the Trinity itself. Now, how do we make this real? This is all really abstract. Um, if we don't want this to be a cold doctrine or some kind of weird religious dogma, then we've got to do something to express the Trinity in our daily lives. And the simple thing that we could do is just to talk with our neighbors and our coworkers. I know that's really hard because we're like, a lot of us are just like Dilbert in the flesh. And we're in our, if we're in our cubicles or, or gosh, we're teleworking. I don't know where we are, but that's not how it's supposed to be. Simply invest in neighbors and coworkers. Uh, Don was telling me, Don Blackwell was telling me about how when, when uh, Uncle Bill and Aunt Dottie died and they all came together, the neighbors, all came together and took care of Davis and her while they were processing the, the, the illness and the death and the grief and, the, and then the other death of Aunt Dottie and all the stuff that they had to deal with. That's what Christians are supposed to be like. Invest in your neighbors. Invest in your coworkers. Talk with people who live on your street. Talk to people at work. Build relationships. Build community. Forget the cubicles. Burn the cubicle. Not literally, okay? But get rid of the cubicle. Talk about things that they like to talk about. Throw block parties. One example is this is tonight, today. It's not going to rain, by the way. Throw block parties. Have neighborhood Yard sales, I don't care what it is. Bring entertainment. Do whatever. Christians should be the finest people on the planet. Christians should be the best networkers on the planet. What would, what would the world look like if every Christian focused on building community and building relationships and networking? We'd have a lot more parties. I mean, they would talk to, about us like they talked about Jesus. He's a wine bibber and a party animal. Anyway. Just make contact, person to person. The second thing the Trinity is important for is that it teaches us about invitation. When we we learn to build relationships in the Trinity, we learn to build community. But all of that comes from having the gift of invitation, seeing the value in invitation. It's an invitation to live our lives in the love of God. Ephesians 1, uh, 17, Paul says this. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know Him better. The purpose of the doctrine of the Trinity is not necessarily to help us describe God. That's an engineering schematic, folks. The purpose of the doctrine of the Trinity is not even to understand Him. It's all we've got to describe how He is, so it's an invitation to get to know Him better. And honestly, that's the role of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Trinity, in the Trinity that we too often ignore. The Holy Spirit brings us into the love of God. He connects us with the Father and the Son. Now look, being a good Wesleyan, I do everything I can not to quote John Calvin, but here we go. As long as Christ remains outside of us, and we are separated from Him. All that He has suffered and done for the salvation of the human race remains useless and of no value for us until our minds become intent upon the Holy Spirit. Christ lies idle because we coldly contemplate Him as outside of ourselves. And that's what the Spirit does. He makes 
Jesus Christ real for us. It's not a bunch of cold contemplation. It's not about knowing about Jesus. It's about knowing Him. And He makes the love of the Father real for us. We experience it within. One of the reasons I think that the church is having so much struggle today in North America and Europe is because we distill Jesus down to theological constructs and we don't know Him anymore. And the love of God doesn't shoot out of our pores anymore. I mean, look at the schmoes that we're up against. Drug addiction, Satan, secularism, materialism. These people are losers when they stand before Jesus Christ. We've taken them before and we can take them again. But it's all about knowing Jesus and not about knowing about Him. The Holy Spirit leads us there. It's about it's not about experiencing some kind of vague, jacked up, weird power or hyping ourselves up and experiencing mass hallucination of some kind. We experience the Trinity because the Holy Spirit pours the love of God into our hearts and that is the only way you can share it. Everything else is just going to be called contemplation. So how do we make this real? Just think about prayer for a minute. When we pray, we experience the Trinity. You know, you can pray each person of the Trinity, which is really cool. But if you're going to do this absolutely biblically, we pray to the Father, through the Son, by the Holy Spirit. We can pray to the Father because Jesus opens the access. We can pray to the Holy Spirit because He is the one who makes us want to pray. And Paul puts it like this in Ephesians 2.9. For through Jesus we have access to the Father by one Spirit. The doctrine of the Trinity invites us to be a part of this wonderful fellowship, this love that exists between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit invites us into. That is invitation. That is why it is important. And it's a lot more important than some stupid football game. Now, that right there, I was on the cover of the bulletin last week. That is a 1425 painting by a Russian monk and Andrei Rubyev is a picture of the Trinity and is used in Eastern Orthodox prayer and contemplation. It's taken from the book of Genesis, but that's another story. Again, you will notice that the Trinity is gathered around a table. And the amazing thing about this picture is right there in the front, right there where the goblet is, at least I think that's a goblet, it may be a bowl full of grapes, but it looks like a goblet from right here. Right there in the front is an open place for you. It's right up there in the front. It's right for you. It's not in the back. You don't get to sit in the nosebleed section. It's right up there in front for you. And you are invited into this relationship. You are invited into this table. Now for some that's eternal, for all, that's eternal salvation. And some people have never given their lives to Christ. They've sat in a pew for 50 years and they've never given their life to Jesus Christ. This is the invitation for you to come and sit at this table. Some people, has, their love has grown cold. Grown cold. This invitation is for you also. So many times we look at the very Word of God and we say, my life does not line up with this. And we hear things that say, you have to get your life perfect. You have to be lined up with the Word before you can enter into this. That table right there is made, built, designed for the messed up and the people who are out of line. But when you go up there, the Word Himself will guide you into alignment with His Word. When you go up there and respond to that invitation, the transformation begins. Now, you're invited to come forward for Holy Communion in just a moment. But, this is not the place for the perfect. It's the place for the people who want to be made perfect. 
Everybody is welcome at this table. Just like that one. That one is a symbol of that one. And that one is a symbol of what is going on in this book. But God did not send a book. He sent a person. And you need to know him. And today, look, while you're kneeling at the altar, take a moment and get to know him. As he is, not as we would impose things on him. Get to know him, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And get your life in line with the very word of God.